Hello, I'm Dr. Costas Canaris and I'm a consultant in paediatric intensive care medicine practicing in Cambridge, UK. I'd like to welcome you to the paediatric emergencies course from wherever in the world you've tuned in from. Please take out your phones as this lecture is meant to be interactive and we will be using live polling. Today I will be speaking to you about the small child with a big heart. I would like to introduce Violet to you. She's a 10 day old baby girl with an unremarkable antenatal and postnatal history. She was born via a normal vaginal delivery at 37 weeks gestation, weighing 2.9 kilos. She was born in good condition and was sent home at day two of life. She has been feeding poorly since she went home. She presents to your emergency department out of hours because the parents are very worried about the poor feeding. On quick inspection and examination, she is alert and crying. She has very mild respiratory distress with bilateral soft crepitations. Her pulses are normal and she's well perfused. You, you think you can just about feel a liver edge. You do a quick set of observations on her and this is what the monitor shows. Her heart rate is 199 and you can just about see P waves on the monitor. Her SATs are 83% in air and these are equal on the left and on the right arm. Her respiratory rate is 55. Her blood pressure is 41 over 23 with a mean of 31 and her temperature is 37.1. You arrange a quick capillary gas. Her pH is 7.26 with a PCO2 of 7.2. Her sodium and potassium are normal. Her ionized calcium is 0.69 and is on the lower side. Her chloride is 104. Her blood sugar is 8.5. Her lactate is 2.5 and her hemoglobin is 92. Her base excess is minus 3.1 and her bicarb is 19.2. I would now like you to take five seconds to write this gas down. You're very concerned about the clinical picture, so you arrange an x-ray. And this is what the x-ray looks like. Now, please join me on slido.com using the code shown on your screens and try and join us in answering the question. So how would you interpret the x-ray? I will give you a couple of seconds to try and um, log on to Slido before I set the timer. Okay, and now you have 30 seconds to try and answer the question. So do you see cardiomegaly with bilateral consolidation? Do you see a large thymus with a left basal effusion and alveolar edema? Do you see cardiomegaly with a left basal effusion and alveolar edema? Or do you see cardiomegaly with left upper lobe collapse and bilateral consolidation? Okay, time's up. So well done to whoever picked the third answer, cardiomegaly, left basal effusion and alveolar edema. So the chest x-ray clearly shows enlargement of the cardiac silhouette with abnormal lung fields characterized by alveolar edema. There's air bronchogram, especially on the right side, and there's a left basal pleural effusion as the costophrenic angle on the left is blunted. So well done, whoever picked answer number three. So the appearance of the x-ray makes you very worried, especially the size of the heart. So you arrange a very quick ECG to try and ascertain if there's any cardiac pathology. You now have 30 seconds to go to Slido and try and interpret the basic findings of this ECG.
Okay, well done to all of you that said um, it's choice number three. So clearly the ECG shows ST segment depression in leads two and AVF as well as V3 and V4 which are the anterior chest leads. There's also very poor R wave progression across the ECG. This is clearly very worrying and suggestive of myocardial ischemia. So far, you have a child with SATs of 83%, and this is equal both pre and post ductal, with a low ish blood pressure, with a large heart on x ray, some left basal consolidation and effusion. That is very tachycardic and in the absence of fever. You also have some very worrying ECG changes. Now please make a diagnostic choice given all the evidence that's been presented to you so far. You have 30 seconds. Does this child have a hyperplastic left heart? Does this child have an acute bacterial myocarditis? Could it be an acute viral myocarditis? Could it be bronchiolitis, pneumonia, or tetralogy of Fallon? Head your bets. Okay, time's up. So, well done to anyone that voted for acute viral myocarditis. Acute bacterial myocarditis is also a plausible answer, however, it's extremely unusual and extremely rare to have myocarditis secondary to a bacterial infection. So the balance of probability, if you think that this child has myocarditis, it is almost always of viral origin. Now the value of point of care ultrasound and basic echo skills has gained a lot of traction over the last few years and cases like this remind us that how useful it is to be good at using the ultrasound probe as a diagnostic tool in our emergency and critical care environments. If you look at the video playing in the background, this is a four chamber view uh, and for those of you with very little um, echo skills, if you go clockwise we can see at the top the left ventricle, then the uh, right ventricle then the right atrium and then the right ventricle and what you will see is that uh, you have a very poorly contracting left ventricle uh, especially affected during di diastole uh, the septum and the mid anterior wall seem to be quite still and that's defined as akinetic uh, in uh, echo terms uh, and there's also a mild degree of tricuspid regurge and mitral regurge which can't be seen very well on this image. Uh, so what this echo suggests is that we have a very poorly functioning LV um, mostly affected during diastole and this is highly suggestive of uh, myocarditis uh, which is in keeping with the history that we got. So now we need to decide what we're going to do with Violet. She is tachycardic, hypoxic, she's got borderline blood pressure, she's got ischemic changes on ECG, and she's got poor LV function on echo. Should we intubate her at this point or should we not? What do you think? Okay, so the truth of the matter is that there's no right and wrong answer at this junction because it largely depends 
on where you are and where you work. If you work in a remote hospital with a poor skill mix, it's entirely reasonable to resuscitate first, give small amounts of fluid in 5 mL per kilo aliquots and assess for response, cap the total amount of fluid to 30 mL per kilo, start some anotropic support, ideally adrenaline and after adrenaline some milrinone and see how she does. If you're in a tertiary hospital with a PICU on site or with a PICU retrieval team within an hour of your centre, um, again you will need to resuscitate before you intubate ideally, but early intubation and early transfer to a cardiac intensive care centre has been shown consistently to improve outcomes for these children. We need to find the window upon which to intubate her because waiting until the cardiac function is worse, waiting until violet arrests is in nobody's interest. So let us assume you have the appropriate skill mix where you work to intubate violet and uh, transfer her to a PICU. What would be the best combination of drugs in order to intubate? Please hedge your bets. Should we choose adrenaline, propofol, fentanyl and rock? Should we choose adrenaline, thiopentone, morphine and sucks? Should we use adrenaline, ketamine, fentanyl and rock? Should we use adrenaline, midaz, morphine and rock? Or should, should we just rely on inhalational induction? Okay, so the truth of the matter is this is a very high risk process. So we need to resuscitate before we intubate, like I said before. Provided we've given a small amount of fluid to fill the child up um, to an extent, then ideally we need to start a monotropic support. Adrenaline is a very forgiving inotrope, and this would be the best choice inotrope at this junction. We also need to be very mindful that a lot of anesthetic induction agents can cause significant vasodilation. Now the last thing you do is, significant, is, is to significantly vasodilate this child, which would cause the blood pressure to drop even more. So things like propofol and thiopentone are a big no-no when we're intubating children in any type of shock, not just cardiogenic shock. So we need to choose the drugs that are likely to cause the least amount of cardiovascular instability. Now, if I was intubating this patient, I would go for option C. I would start a peripheral adrenaline infusion. I wouldn't put a central line first. Um, if needed, if I can't get I, uh, IV access, I would put an intraosseous um, needle in. I would use one milligram per kilo of ketamine, one microgram per kilo of fentanyl, and one to two milligrams per kilo of rocuronium, because that is sig significantly the safest modality uh, to use to intubate this child. Those drugs are also in the new APLS update that came out late, late last year. So what is acute myocarditis? Well, it is defined as a process characterized by inflammatory infiltrates of the myocardium with necrosis and or degeneration of myocytes. Necrosis suggests uh, cell death and degeneration uh, suggests a decrease in function of cardiac muscle cells. Now, Because there is such damage to the cardiac muscle cells, it would explain why cardiac enzymes are high when we check them in patients with cardiac damage or cardiac ischemia. So if you're having difficulty understanding or um, coming to the right diagnosis of a patient because a significant overlap between respiratory uh, patients and cardiac patients in terms of how they present, then you should have a low threshold of checking uh, enzymes such as troponin and CKMB. I can tell you that in Violet's case, troponin was 
325 so the normal range is up to 14 and her CKMB was above a thousand which is very high which was significantly suggestive of myocardial damage which took us down a different diagnostic route so there are a number of ways in which acute myocarditis can present in children we are more accustomed to seeing the fulminant version of myocarditis uh, in ICU uh, because those are the ones that usually need admission to a cardiac intensive care unit so these are the very sick children in cardiogenic shock not dissimilar to how violet presented uh, but the difficulty is that there there is a big spectrum uh, ranging from the very well looking child to the very unwell looking child that can be covered by the myocarditis umbrella. Indeed, some children have no symptoms whatsoever and get a very mild version of uh, a self-limiting viral myocarditis. And those obviously slip through the net because you don't necessarily screen <coughs> for conditions such as viral myocarditis if they present with primarily respiratory problems. Uh, depending on the severity of, uh, of the myocarditis, those may go on to develop myocardial, myocardial scarring, which will then lead them to be prone to arrhythmias. Now, arrhythmias and dysrhythmias and conduction defects is another way in which myocarditis can present, uh, either secondary to scarring or in the acute phase. Um, you will have no doubt seen in the media a number of uh, sports uh, men and sports women uh, having cardiac arrests whilst playing their sports, some of which are successfully resuscitated and some not. Now, the differential diagnosis for those situations are usually um, acute or genetic in origin. Um, in the acute cases, myocarditis is often top of the list. Uh, and in the um, genetic causes, we have things such as channelopathies or long QT syndrome, such as Brugada syndrome or Javel Langnickson. Um, so, always have um, acute myocarditis on your list of differentials if a child presents with an unusual arrhythmia. Um, in some cases, uh, children present with sudden death. Uh, and the diagnosis uh, done on post-mortem is acute myocarditis. Some is truly acute and some again because of uh, an older, very mild myocarditis that led to secondary scarring. Uh, and some others uh, ha have a very slow grumbling process. So they tend to present with a worn out, tired heart mm -hmm. and either acute or chronic heart failure. Uh, so you need to have a very low index of suspicion um, uh, upon which to think could this be myocarditis and doing cardiac enzymes as early as possible will help you choose whether the pathology is uh, cardiac or non-cardiac in origin. Uh, there are a number of uh, causes of myocarditis in children, by, but by far the commonest uh, are viral in origin. So in the UK, the commonest viruses uh, associated with myocarditis are adenovirus, enterovirus and parvovirus, um, influenza, HS, HSV, CMV and RSV, as well as more recently SARS-CoV-2 have been known to cause it. Uh, bacterial causes of myocarditis are extremely rare, uh, and there are also uh, rickettsial causes of myocarditis which uh, we don't commonly see in the UK but we do see in other parts of the world uh, so lice, mites, fleas and ticks um, uh, bites and of any of those um, um, organisms uh, can cause a myocarditis uh, there are also protozoal causes uh, such as Chagas disease which is um, extremely rare in the West uh, and we must never forget non-infectious causes of myocarditis such as 
hypersensitivity or autoimmune causes, uh, for example, uh, lupus, um, and various uh, causes of uh, drugs uh, and drug toxicity, uh, usually uh, chemotherapy uh, and antipsychotics. Um, uh, clozapine is probably the commonest cause of drug-related myocarditis, um, as well as very rarely in some vaccines, especially smallpox vaccine. So always remember the atherogenic causes of myocarditis, but also how rare these can be. So how do we manage children with myocarditis on our ICU? Well, the first thing to do is to intubate them and ventilate them. Now, the term semi-elective is a loaded one because this is not clearly a truly elective situation. What I mean by that is that we need to find the right window upon which to intubate them. So we need to intubate them before they're ready to arrest, before they have collapsed. And to do that, we will need to optimize the intubation processes, like we discussed before, by uh, starting a bit of peripheral anotrope and fluid resuscitating them adequately and not too much. Now, this is important. In, when we fluid resuscitate, we need to give five mL per kilo aliquots and keep an eye on the monitor. We need to take ownership of that uh, fluid bolus and push it ourselves and look at how the heart rate reacts when we push the fluid in. Is the heart rate dropping or, or is there no change at all? Because if the heart rate is dropping, then it would suggest that the child is fluid responsive. Be, however, cautious. We mustn't give any more than 20 to 30 mL per kilo of volume to these children. The rationale behind this is that we do not want to over distend uh, a, a heart that is already failing. We now need to use inotropes to our advantage. And the best two anotropes to use in most of uh, myocarditis cases are adrenaline first and mildenone second. And you need to start those drugs in that order. And I will explain why. Uh, we need to take advantage of adrenaline's beta effects at a low dose. So we need to optimize the inotropy offered by, uh, by adrenaline. We need to try and avoid having high dose adrenaline on these patients because that would uh, amplify the alpha effects adrenaline has and we do not want that. Uh, what I mean by that is that alpha effects include potent vasoconstriction and if you vasoconstrict, obviously the afterload will increase and the myocardium will have to work a lot more and that would be a disadvantage to the patient. Once you start to adrenaline, and given the child some anotropic reserve and support, that's the junction upon which to start the milrinone. Milrinone is an anodilator, uh, is a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor, uh, and it tends to improve diastolic function. The problem with milrinone is if you start it first, or if you start it before you've adequately fluid resuscitated, these children um, can become very vasodilated very quickly and might even arrest. So always use it with the support of um, and the advice of a cardiologist and or the critical care retrieval team um, if you have to use it in a DGH and never as a first line anotrope, always uh, as a second agent. In severe fulminant cases, then ECMO can be used as a bridge to recovery. So ECMO essentially is uh, mechanical support to both the heart and the lungs. Uh, in most UK centres, you can uh, uh, they're able to use uh, VV and VA ECMO. Um, it depends on the clinical situation, uh, and we'll talk a bit about ECMO and outcomes and indications in the next slides. Um, immunoglobulins and immunosuppression has been used uh, in uh, various UK centres to improve myocarditis outcomes. However, there's no high quality trial data to support this practice. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but there's very low level evidence um, to support this. Uh, and obviously in cases that uh, are extremely sick and extremely difficult and those that tend to not be able to come off ECMO support, then transplantation is indicated 
uh, and there's a uh, there's a fast track list in the UK for children with myocarditis um, in order to get to become uh, heart transplant recipients. So what are the outcomes of children with acute myocarditis? Well, the overall mortality of uh, these children is about 7%. Um, but obviously that's um, only one side of the coin because we need to look at how children do three, you know, three or more years after uh, they get discharged from ICU um, because this is a condition that can le lead to a chronic uh, comorbidities and chronic mortality and obviously need long-term follow-up by the cardiology services. Uh, so 6% of those children that are discharged uh, will die without a transplant uh, within three years. Uh, just over 50% will uh, return back to normal with normal cardiac function and no obvious scarring. Uh, nearly one in five will require a transplant after they uh, get myocarditis and that is a huge number if you um if you consider how many children we have seen come through our emergency department doors uh, with myocarditis and about 20 percent will uh, survive but with long-term uh, injury uh, and effects to the cardiac function so we briefly touched upon ecmo uh, especially va ecmo which is uh, uh, what would uh, commonly be needed uh, in children in fulminant myocarditis that are not getting better on um, conventional uh, ICU therapy. Um, so ECMO stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation uh, and it, it, it's a way of getting um, venous blood out of the patient, oxygenating it and delivering it back uh, as oxygenated blood. Uh, and obviously there's a pump involved which... Um, takes over the function of the heart. Uh, uh, looking at our diagram, you can see there's a, a cannula that goes into the uh, right atrium of the patient. We take deoxygenated blood out of there. Uh, then the blood is uh, heparinized uh, initially um, in order to be uh, made thinner so as to avoid clots into the circuit. Uh, and then it's run through a pump uh, and then uh, through a membrane oxygenator uh, and a blender uh, as well as a heat exchanger to warm everything up and allow the right uh, gas exchange to take place thereby um, replacing the role of the lungs and the alveoli uh, and then the uh, oxygenated blood is then returned back to the patient um, and in this case uh, it is returned through into the arterial circulation by, by the carotid uh, uh, artery. Now as you can see uh, there are lots of things that can go wrong um, and this is a high risk process so starting with how the cannulas are inserted uh, some are needed to be done uh, transcutaneously and that's the usual practice in the UK although in some situations uh, it needs to be done uh, as an open um, procedure through a stenotomy. Um, obviously, because the blood needs to be heparinized so that the circuit doesn't clot, um, there's uh, always a risk that uh, we over heparinize uh, and the patient sustains a bleed. Uh, if we under heparinize, then the circuit will clot with all the uh, uh, secondary. Uh, systemic effects that the patient will have when the ECMO circuit is not working um, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's a very useful uh, way to bridge patients to recovery or to bridge them until they get a transplant but it's still a very high risk uh, procedure. In the next slide I will show you uh, what the survival rates for any pathology of children going on to ECMO looks like. Uh, internationally based on the ECMO uh, ECLS registry. So this is a lovely uh, chart uh, which summarizes uh, nicely the uh, uh, results from the International Pediatric ECMO 
registry uh, since records began. The paper came out last year, so it's reasonably hot off the press. Um, and as you can see, there has been an exponential rise on the use of ECMO for any pathology in children, uh, starting from 1987, which is the very first uh, green and blue dot on your charts. Uh, and internationally, we are now having between 14 and 15 uh, 100 runs of ECMO or VA ECMO per year um, for children for a number of different pathologies. Uh, as you can see, survival um, uh, is fluctuant, but overall, there seems to be an upgoing trend over the years. But this is very much uh, pathology um, dependent. So, children with primary lung pathology such as meconium aspiration or diaphragmatic hernias uh, and asthma tend to have very good outcomes uh, whereas children with hemoncological malignancies um, or, or myocarditis um, or sepsis uh, tend to do less well so always look at the fine print when you're trying to uh, uh, decipher these charts to see what the exact pathologies are in order to be able to ascertain what uh, the outcomes are uh, for each pathology on a child on VA ECMO. So these are the top tips for um, managing a child with acute myocarditis when they come through your uh, uh, emergency department. Uh, if things don't quite make sense, if you can't quite understand why the blood pressure is a bit saggy, why the child has an arrhythmia, why the heart rate is out of keeping with uh, the overall clinical picture, um, have a low threshold of suspicion. Try and recognize it early, uh, do a proper ECG to, um, to look for ischemic changes um, and do an X-ray to look for signs of cardiac uh, Don't forget to send your cardiac enzymes because if that troponin or that CKMB is high, then it's more than likely that, that there's a degree of myocardial injury already, uh, which will heighten your level of suspicion that this could be a myocarditis. Uh, the commonest features of, of myocarditis, ischemic changes on the ECG, elevated cardiac en enzymes. And if you have someone um, who's able to do very basic echo, um, then they will be able to find le left ventricular dysfunction on echo. Um, don't forget to minimize the atrogenic harm. So if you are going to give fluid, give it in 5 ml per kilo aliquots with a maximum of 20 to 30 ml per kilo in total. Um, inotropes and early inotropes are your friends regardless of whether you're planning to intubate or not. So try and start the peripheral adrenaline early uh, and after you've done that uh, and ideally after you've done an echo you can start some melanin with the advice and support of the regional cardiology and PICU services. Uh, and do try and intubate these children before they arrest and before they collapse, because often they get worse before they get better. Uh, so try and find the right window upon which to intubate them. Uh, if things are, are looking worse, despite maximal support on uh, your ICU, then transfer to a regional ECMO center uh, is likely to improve uh, the option treatments and the prognosis by extension. So I hope you've enjoyed today's talk. If you uh, want to do some further reading, I have collated all the papers I used um, for the presentation in the QR code shown, and you will get full access to the papers uh, on the link. So please save it uh, for future uh, reference. If you have any questions, during the live stream, please ask, ask them through the uh, YouTube channel. And if you have any questions, uh, if you're not watching this live, please tweet me uh, on at Dr. Canaris, provided Twitter is still up and running after the recent takeover. Thank you very much for watching.